G'day everyone, welcome back to another How to Forge. Today we're forging a trailing point buoy and we're starting out with some 5mm by 65mm SUP9 stock. So it's a 5160 equivalent spring steel uh, and because it's 65mm wide I need to narrow it up. So first I'm going to knock the corners in to prevent fish mouthing and then you're going to see me upset the material down uh, into about five and a half to six mil thick stock and about mm -hmm. 45 mil wide. So just over, uh, just under two inches. <laughs> um, now, obviously stock prep is an incredibly important part of making any knife. And it is a process to actually take quite seriously because if you're not uh, careful with how flat and even you get everything, then your knife can go wrong. Remember, preform, 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 and preform starts in the stock. It doesn't start in the shape of the tip or anything like that, it starts in the stock. So, once I have my stock established, I'm going to actually use a flatter that I forged in the, my most recent video before this one, and I'm going to flatten it out so that it is all perfect, ready to start the next step. I'm staying focused on having just the length for the blade and the ricasso and maybe the, the shoulders behind the ricasso uh, move down to stock size because I can always grab more material from that main bar to draw out into the tang but for now I just want the stock for the blade and the ricasso. The longer the piece of stock you're working on the harder it is to control even when it's attached to the main bar. So here we are just using the flatter. Uh, and if you cut in with any of the corners of your flatter, because like the radius on these are, is quite tight, um, just make sure you're getting everything perfectly flat and hit a little bit lighter, and you'll be able to smooth those out, hopefully. Now I've, I've made this whole video uh, in one and a half times speed, just to speed things up. I do want to show you every hammer bloke, because that's how this whole How to Forge series works. So you see exactly how I manipulate the stock, but again, it's a little bit faster this time. So here we go, knocking in those corners, and you want to knock them in at as close to a 45 degree angle as you can, getting over the top of the stock and forging back towards yourself. Really pushing that stock in, because if you're just hammering down on the corner like I am now, then what would happen is that those edges would uh, accelerate past the center of the block or the center of the bar and you'll end up with a fish mouth and that's something we don't want. However, during this forging I'm going to show you how I approach a fish mouthed uh, piece of steel if I end up getting one, although I don't get it on this piece, I, I figured it was important to show you. Uh, now I'm again just forging the tip down into the standard drop point uh, this will be a trailing point buoy, so we're going to push that back in a minute, but here we go, cutting off that end of the stock with the edge of the anvil, just forging down right to a point, and then uh, as I forge on the side and just forge it back and forth, it's going to snap off, and we're going to have a perfectly sharp tip. Now, what's different about this uh, project, this specific trailing point bluey, is that it was supposed to be uh, my town's bow build-off <laughs> entry, uh, and I wanted to forge as close to finish as possible, to leave as much of the forge finish as was possible. So, this is going to take a, a few more heats than usual, and I'm going to be very careful with how I approach uh, all of the processes, making sure that I keep everything clean and straight. And you can see that I'm now forging a nice straight line for my point, because when we forge bevels in, that straight line is then going to become a reverse curve, or a concave, uh, and that's going to give us our trailing point. And I like a nice sharp transition between the spine of the knife and the, uh, the transition for the angle mm -hmm. of the point. Now it pays to remember that when you're forging your stock, you want to uh, distally taper your stock, but you also want to... Uh, do a taper on the lateral. You want to taper from where the ricasso is going to be or where the heel of the knife is going to be down towards the point in both angles. And part of the reason for that, especially when prepping the stock, is that as you then draw your distal taper, that end is going to widen out a little bit. And that means that you're going to end up with either parallel or wider at the tip. And unless you're specifically aiming for wider at the tip, like with a sax, uh, you want a little bit more of a taper, and because this is a fighting knife, we want a nice, thin, lean profile. Even though it's a quite wide blade, like this blade ends up being uh, a smidge over two inches wide, 
uh, it's still going to be that slightly mean taper towards the point, and we want that for a, a nice fast fighting blade. So you just saw me use uh, my straight peen to then peen it out, and then now we're just dressing everything back straight with a flat face of a hammer. Uh, and this is giving us our distal taper, but when we distally taper things, obviously we end up with a little bit of swelling in various directions. So we want to come back and dress that all out, and then coming back with our flatter, we can finalize that taper. And this is one of the biggest reasons that I have the flatter, is because when doing forged to finish pieces, having a flatter to just dress everything out, although I did cut in with the, with the heel of it a little bit there, still need a little bit of practice. Um, we can get a really nice finish. And here we are starting the bevels. And I'm starting the bevels with quite a deep radius. And again, we're gonna be drawing this down quite thin because we're forging as close to finish as we can. I'm just focusing on that heel right now. I'm leaning the blade uh, into the bevel because I want a nice angled, uh, angled plunge cut. But I'm also leaning the blade slightly down in my tong hand so that it's actually angled against the corner of the anvil. And then what I do is, as I draw that heel down, I then lift my tong hand or lift my stock hand up so that it's flat with the anvil, so that uh, I can cut that plunge cut really sharply like I'm trying to do a double set down, which is what a plunge cut is. And then as I lift up, I can then even it out and move down the blade. And as I'm forging the bevels, I'm forging section by section, and the sections are about half a hammer face's width. Uh, so they're overlapping and I'm hammering on the edge of where the last hammer marks were. And the reason for that is because then you get a perfectly even uh, form of bevel. And all you get is you're looking for an even expansion of width because obviously you get as much width in the blade as you remove in thickness. Right, so if you have six mil of stock uh, in thickness, then you will get six mil of stock in uh, width. Now here I'm just dressing out a little bit of the banana curve. You can pre-curve your billets, again, I prefer not to. Uh, and in this case it was just because it wasn't getting into my forge the way I wanted it to, so I'm straightening it out a little bit with a wooden block before I go back to forging the rest of the bevels. And it's okay to dress your curve out at any point during the forging if it's difficult for you. But again, we're gonna go along going to mushroom that back in because again you're upsetting the edge back into itself when you straighten a blade like that you're actually pushing material back on itself um, so you want to actually upset that material back into the edge and we'll just keep moving down the blade uh, overlapping our hammer blows making sure that we're getting even dispersion of steel so we're getting an even edge thickness or an even edge width as we go down the blade, and we're not going to final thickness at this point, because remember, we're forging as close to final finish as we can, and at this stage, because we're forging quite heavy, and because we're still forging the general shape of the knife, there is a bit of adjustment that needs to be made that requires edge on forging, and if it's too thin at that point, all it's going to do is fold. Right, so once we've got that shape established, I'm just going to use the fullering tool on the uh, guillotine tool to just create a little bit of a shoulder reference for where we're going to start the tang. Uh, and then we're going to start forging that tang in before we then cut it off and forge the tang the rest of the way out. And I just find this helps to align the shoulders of my anvil. You can do it without it. You can just align the edges of your anvil and the edge of your hammer much like when you're doing your plunge cut and you can create that double set down, but I find the guillotine tool just makes it a little bit faster. You could use a spring swage as well. Uh, all of those things work. It just, you know, depends on what tooling you have available. And so once we forge down to those shoulders, we're then gonna cut the material off. I cut, I tend to cut more material than I need. Uh, and I cut back to where the original bar th uh, width and thickness was so that I don't have to worry about that bar in the future. And this will give me more than enough material to then make a full length tang for a through tang construction when I finally finish this buoy, whenever that will be. <laughs> 
and it pays to remember to keep the shoulders off the anvil. In any case where you're forging something with a shoulder, uh, whether it be a single shoulder or a double shoulder, always keep your shoulders off the anvil. Unless you're forging on the flat like this with the cross pin, uh, when you're on edge like that, make sure that the shoulder either stays at the edge of the anvil or off it completely. Because if you bring that shoulder onto the anvil, all you're going to be doing is bending the stock and potentially uh, smashing that shoulder down and actually ruining the shoulder completely or pushing the tang offline. So be very careful when you're forging tangs and stuff like that or any offset uh, that you don't end up smashing your shoulders by keeping them on the anvil. And the big thing I'm trying to remember here is that I'm trying to taper from the ricasso down to the tip of the tang, right? I'm distally tapering in the opposite direction from where the blade is so that the thickest point of the knife in both directions will be at the ricasso or at the tang shoulders. Uh, now, obviously, if I was using a grinder, I could do that after the forging, but I can't do that in this case because I want to forge as close as possible to finish. So I'm forging this tang basically to final dimension. Um, I can do a bit of grinding because no one's going to see it on the inside of the handle, but, you know, a little bit of uh, blacksmith's pride goes into getting it as close as I can. And again, uh, the flatter is going to feature here in a second as well, just to finally true up the taper and make sure that we're getting that line all the way from the ricasso to the tang. And before I do that, I'm actually going to define my ricasso. So, the ricasso is way too wide at this point for what I want for the knife, because the ricasso tends to set the width of your handle, right? So if your ricasso is 40 millimeters tall, then your handle should be 40 millimeters tall in order for those lines to flow into each other. But a 40 millimeter tall handle is an incredibly hard handle to hold. It's very uncomfortable. So what we're going to do is just thin down that ricasso. You don't want to thin it down too much because then it looks ungainly or off, off balance. But we're just going to use an offset blows to uh, move that ricasso up a little bit and thin it down so that then when we put a handle on it, it's going to be more in line with what a hand would actually be able to hold. <laughs> the end user has always got to be in mind when you're forging a knife. And so now we go to the flatter and we're actually, I'm actually using the flatter trying to go parallel on the ricasso and then following the taper on the tang. Uh, trying not to cut with the edge of the flatter. I think I need to work on the the, the uh, edges of the flatter. And now here comes the final forging step. Something that uh, I haven't shown before is wet forging. Uh, so in the Japanese tradition it's called kitai, or um, in the Western tradition it's called wet forging. And it just involves putting water on the anvil and forging into it. And what you'll notice is in the first couple of hits, in the in the beginning of the heat, I forge very quickly one side then the other. I flip quickly and I move the, the uh, blade all over the anvil because every time that the blade is uh, struck on top of the water, that water atomizes, cools the scale on the surface of the metal and then blows it off. But the problem is that then there's no water underneath anymore. So you have to move the blade around in order to take advantage of where the water is. You'll also notice that I lift the blade a little bit between those movements so that I actually get water underneath it and I'm constantly refreshing that water between heats. You also notice that I am forging a little bit colder than normal. This is a risk that you take when forging like this but I'm actually forging quite gently and I'm just planishing at a very very low heat to get those final little details out because what I'm trying to do is blast the scale off, get the scale out of the way on the anvil and then planish out the material so that it's nice and smooth uh, before we finally finish. And it's at this heat and with this technique that I'm actually refining my plunge line and I'm also refining the uh, the grind line because the grind height of this knife is about uh, two thirds of the way up the blade because the spine has to be relatively flat or relatively square in order to take the sparring bar that it was going to eventually have. The same process can be done on the tang, getting it all clean, getting it all neat, getting it all tidy. It's not necessary, but I like it. If I'm going to do it to one side, I may as well do it to the other. But it pays to remember that the higher the heat you get and the more oxidizing flame you have in your forge, the more scale you're going to get. So you want a really neutral fire and you want to work at a relatively low heat comparative to what you would normally do in a forge just to prevent the amount of scale building up 
that you then have to blow off and planish out. So if you have low amounts of scale, this planishing step will work a lot better. I noticed at the end that the curve wasn't quite what I wanted, it was actually a little too curved in the, uh, in the spine area, so I actually just took it back to a wooden block, and this time not doing it on the anvil face, and the reason for that is because I don't want to upset too much of that shoulder between the tip and the, uh, the spine, so you'll notice I did a couple taps there with the thing, but unfortunately nothing big. And here, this is the last ride of Marty McFly Press, he's now been sold. Uh, and you'll notice that I did make a mistake and that the mark is upside down because I didn't check. But there you have it. Plunge cuts are nice and even. The edge thickness is down to uh, 1 16th of an inch, or like, I think it's like uh, three uh, less than 3 millimeters, about 2, 1.5 millimeters. Um, there you go, there's the upside down mark. <laughs> Everything's nice and straight. There's a little bit of truing up that needs to be done with files. Uh, on the heel and stuff like that. It wasn't perfect, there was a little bit of improvement to be made. But uh, overall, not bad, not bad. I'd like to say a massive thank you to my patrons. Without them, this uh, kind of stuff wouldn't be possible. This kind of educational content is thanks to them. Uh, if you'd like to join them, please hit the uh, link in the description or at the end of this video. I hope you have a fantastic week. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Make sure that if you do, you catch it on film. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.